Ready? Okay. I'm sorry that this screen is blocking some of your beautiful faces. I will try to peep over as often as I can. Thank you for coming today. I was uh, thinking how embarrassed it would be if I got it. All right, I'll try to do it better. How's that? Everybody hear that? Anybody cannot hear? I think maybe this will work. I had about uh, two months of speech therapy recently, and they said you got to breathe in and speak from down here. So that's what I'm going to try to do, and this will be good practice. Thank you for coming today. If I had gotten here and nobody showed up, it was going to be very embarrassing. <laughs> the subject is, uh, is rethinking hell. And you may think, why should anybody rethink hell? Because the first time they thunk it, they didn't do a good job. <laughs> and so we're going to be talking about that. Lots of people are talking about hell these days. I've, I did have some names of scholars. My wife said nobody there cares about any of those people. Uh, so I've got some more real people. And you may be too old like me to know who these people are. But uh, Rob Bell has been in the news quite a bit. He's the fellow that uh, got the little farewell Rob Bell tweet when he put his book out, and others as well. Everybody's talking about hell. Oh, two weeks from now on the weekend, there's a conference on conditional immortality, Rethinking Hell Conference in Houston. Uh, we're bringing people from six countries and three continents to talk about this subject. And it's a hot subject, no pun intended. <laughs> There are three views of hell in the history of the church. All three of them are held today by some people. Uh, first of all, there's the traditional view of the fire that torments forever. This is what nearly all Christians have believed since the time of Augustine, about 400 A.D. And so uh, if you meet anybody in the street and say, what's hell like? If they believe in it, they probably will say, people go there and burn forever. Torments forever is a traditional view. The second view is that the hell purifies people or causes them to repent and gives them a chance to repent. And they eventually all repent and go to heaven. That would be a very nice outcome if it could be the case. If God wants it to be, it will be. But at this point, I don't see that that's what he says will happen. That's the fire that purifies in that view. And then the third view is what I call the biblical view of the fire that consumes and this wording comes from Hebrews, which says our God is a consuming fire. That's quoting from Deuteronomy. So both Old and New Testaments say our God is a consuming fire. But the traditional view leaves us with a hard question to think about. Is it something that we must believe that God who loves sinners so much that he gave his son to save them will in the end keep billions if not billions of them alive forever and ever just to torment them without end when he could let them die if he would. That doesn't sound like the God of the Bible to many, many people these days. In this lesson today, I'm going to present as far as our time allows, and I'm going to talk fast and faster as we go if I need to, <laughs> to tell you six surprising truths I learned from the Bible which make me answer no to that question. It's not necessary to believe that. The Bible, in fact, teaches something different from that, I believe, very clearly. Uh, the, the, the book that I'll be talking about today uh, in, in passing is on the bottom right hand of that screen, of that slide, The Fire That Consumes. This was a book I wrote 32 years ago, uh, 35 years ago. Uh, I was hired by an Australian publisher to do a research project on hell and tell him everything in the Bible on the subject of the end of the wicked, plus everything in church history and how the other idea got started and why everybody believes it. And as I got into that study, I changed my own mind and I said, I have to write a book about this and tell what the Bible really says as I see it because it didn't say what I thought it said. And so The Fire That Consumes was the book that came from that. 32 years later, that book has been instrumental as God has seen fit to use it in a relaunching a rethinking of hell around the world among evangelicals. I'm not the only person involved in that, of course, but this book had a, a, some attributable part in it. 
In the top left hand of the screen is the book, Hell, the Final Word. The book on the bottom right hand has uh, 500 pages, roughly, and over 1,000 footnotes. The one on the top left is uh, almost no footnotes and no Greek and Hebrew words, and anybody in the street can read who wants to read. And it's, it's got all the information just about the big book has. So if you're interested, both of those books are for sale this week here at ACU uh, exhibit and also at the Lipscomb exhibit. In the center is a, a DVD of a movie, Hell and Mr. Fudge. That'll be showing uh, tonight, God willing, at 8.30 uh, at Shamblin and tomorrow afternoon from 2 to 4. Uh, your program has it wrong and part of it says tomorrow night, but it's really tonight and tomorrow afternoon. That's the story of, of the personal story behind the research project, and it's really a pretty good movie. Uh, I didn't have anything to do with making it except cooperate with it, and they made a story around my life. But it, it's a very good, well-made movie, and I think you would enjoy it if you can see it. Surprising truth number one, six surprising truths that made me say hell is not eternal torment. It's, it's something different. The first surprising truth is the Old Testament says much about the end of sinners. The traditionalists have always said the Old Testament is silent about hell. And if they mean the word hell, they're right. The word hell is not in the Old Testament, meaning the word Gehenna, the Greek word in the New Testament. Uh, the Old Testament does say a lot, however, about the end of the wicked under other ways of speaking. The Old Testament Bible and the Jews divided it into three parts. Jesus refers to these in Luke 24, the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and he says the Psalms, which is the first book of what they call the writings. We're going to look at each of these three quickly to say just a taste of what they say about the end of the wicked. First, the writings are the Psalms. These speak in principles about the end of the wicked. One example, and there are many we could look at, is Psalm 37, which says, Don't fret because of evildoers. A little while and the wicked man will be no more. Wait for the Lord. When the wicked are cut off, you will see it. But we say, what if we don't see it? Some wicked people die prospering. Some wicked people die famous. Some wicked people die praised. What about them? Is God's justice thwarted? No, God said they will be finally done away. He's going to still take care of it someday. It just will happen in the age to come, not now. So if we don't see it now, we should not give up. It will happen. The Psalms have statements like this, more than 50 Hebrew verbs that say the wicked will perish, they will vanish, they will be destroyed, they will be no more. Active and passive verbs both. And those words just sound, every one of them, like they're totally gone and never come back again. Uh, the Old Testament says in many places that God will break them in pieces, slay them, cut them off, blot them out of the book of the living, all sound like total destruction. And the Old Testament says, the wicked will be like chaff that's blown away, smoke that vanishes, wax that melts, water that flows away, a dream from which one awakens, a slug that somebody puts salt on and it dissolves, and on and on and on. Seventy metaphors and similes, and they all sound like total destruction. So the Old Testament <coughs> and the... And the uh, Alec, can you get that for me, please? The water. Uh, Ed's going to do it. Thank you, brother Ed. The wicked will be like, like these things. God will do what He said, and these things will happen to them in the end. Please note, these are not necessarily literal. But because they're not literal, does not mean they will not correspond. They, these things somehow match what will happen may not be literally these things, but when it happens, people will say that's what God said. And it certainly will not be the exact opposite. So if God said they will be as if they've never been, it will not be the case that they will never be as if they had never been. If God said they will be vanished like uh, smoke, it will never be the case that they will never vanish like smoke. Something like that will happen. And when it happens, people will say God has kept His word. The, 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 the writings speak in principles, as we've just seen. The law or the Torah speaks also in prototypes. There, there are two major prototypes in the Torah. 
First is the flood. We have in clear language what happened to the people in the flood. Genesis says they perished. They died. God blotted them out. What does it mean they perished? Well, they died. What does it mean they died? They perished. What does it mean they were blotted out? They died and perished. And who's got a problem with that? We all know what these words mean. So why is it that people have trouble knowing what they mean when the New Testament says that's what will happen to the wicked at the end of the world? That is an example of what will happen. Peter says the world back then was destroyed. That's his word to describe it. Flooded with water. But the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire. Kept for the destruction of ungodly men. So just as the world was destroyed by water, ungodly men will be destroyed by fire. And Peter says that that's a prototype of what will happen. A second prototype in the Old Testament Torah is the Sodom and Gomorrah destruction. What happened then? God rained down brimstone and fire out of heaven. He overthrew the cities, the inhabitants, and everything that grew on the ground. And this is an example, we're told, of what will happen to the wicked at the end of the world. Peter says, God condemned Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes. That's what destruction meant. They were reduced to ashes. And he says that's an example of what will happen to the ungodly. Jude says a similar thing. Sodom and Gomorrah are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. What will happen to the wicked at the end of the world? Look at Sodom. What will happen to the wicked at the end of the world? Look at the flood. These are prototypes that we're told are examples of what will be. The Old Testament prophets have many predictions of what will happen. And I've just picked out four. Now, these are all four messianic passages which the New Testament uses and applies to Jesus. First, they will be shattered like pottery. Psalm 2, 7 through 9. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. If you throw a clay pot down on the ground, what happens to it? Shatters into a jillion pieces. And we know what that means. It's destroyed. It's no use anymore. Oh, they will be like corpses left exposed in Psalm 110. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead. And it's a clear picture. Then Isaiah 66, 24, the most widely quoted Bible passage on the final destruction of the wicked in the whole Bible. This is a picture of the end of the world. The wicked go into the New Jerusalem. I mean, sorry, the righteous go into the New Jerusalem and they come out and look on the corpses of those whom the Lord has slain where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. And they will be in abhorrence to all flesh. What do they see when they come out? They come out and they see corpses, not living people, dead bodies. Corpses of those the Lord has slain. Slain means they're dead. And they're corpses. And it's what's happening to them? They're being consumed. Maggots are chewing on them. Hope it's not too close to breakfast. Maggots are chewing on them. The fire is smoldering. And the fire is devouring. And the worms are devouring. And when they get through devouring, there will be nothing left. So this is the end of the wicked, according to Isaiah 66, 24. They will be in abhorrence. That means that you feel sick at your stomach when you see it. You think it's disgusting. It's repulsive. You don't want to look at it or think about it. And then Malachi has these very straightforward words. The day is coming, he says, burning like a furnace. And they will be set ablaze, the wicked will be. Left neither root nor branch. If you have a tree and you burn it up and there's no branch left and no root left, how much is left? Big zip. Nothing. There's nothing left. The wicked will be ashes under the soles of your feet, he says. This is a picture, again, not necessarily literal, but true and, and, and real, and it will match what happens in the end. Do we get the picture? These are pictures. Do we get the picture? Well, it, it will be like broken pottery, and that's something of a picture of what will be of the wicked. Battlefield corpses piled up the corpses on the field of battle. They will be like corpses that are being consumed by fire and maggots. They will be like ashes underfoot. These are pictures from the Old Testament prophecy of the end of the wicked. So that's what the Old Testament has to say. The, the traditionalists have said for 1,600 years, the Old Testament doesn't tell us anything on this subject. Well, that's very easy to understand why they would say that. 
First of all, because they went looking for the wrong thing and they couldn't find what they were looking for, so they said there's nothing there. Second of all, when they did find what was there, if they recognized what they were seeing, they didn't really want to think about that because that didn't match what they thought the Bible clearly taught. So it's just been that kind of a vicious cycle. But uh, that was the first surprise. The Bible has a lot to say in the Old Testament. And it's all different from what I thought it said to begin with. Second surprise. The, 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 the traditionists have said for 1,600 years, when Jesus came along, the traditional doctrine of eternal torment had developed between the Testaments and everybody in, of the Jews believed it. So when we read Jesus' words, they say, we have to assume that's what He means because that's what all the Jews believed in the time of Christ. Well, ding dong, you're wrong again. That's not what happened. That, and how do we know? Well, there's, uh, the people in olden days couldn't be expected to know because they didn't have good sources. But since uh, the 20th century, we've had several very good sources, the Apocrypha, the Pseudepigrapha, Dead Sea Scrolls and the rabbinic literature. And this is what we find if we look in those Jewish sources between the Testaments. The Apocrypha, except for one passage, has every passage in the Apocrypha has consuming fire. That's what the Apocrypha books expected. The wicked will be consumed. There's one exception to that in the book of Judith. The last verse in Judith, 16.24, 16.17, Judas says, Woe to those nations that rise up against my race. The Lord Almighty will take vengeance against them in the day of judgment. Put fire and worms in their flesh and they will weep and feel their pain forever. That's eternal torment. By the time Judith is writing, Alexander the Great, they conquered the world. A little joke there. Alexander the Great had conquered the world and he comes through and teaches everybody the Greek language and Greek culture. Part of what he spread was Greek philosophy. Part of that was the immortality of the soul. That seeped into Jewish thinking, some of it. And so in the time of Judith, she's already beginning to think in terms of immortality of the soul. And she has this one passage. She says, God will put worms and fire in their flesh. We're going to see how that's different from Isaiah in just a moment. And they will weep and feel their pain forever. If the Old Testament said this, it would teach eternal torment. But it doesn't say this. And Judith changed Isaiah to say what she wanted to say instead of what he said. Isaiah pictured corpses. Judith pictures living people. Isaiah said the corpses are consumed. Judith said they're tormented. Isaiah said the worms and fire are external. They're outside the people eating the corpses. Judith said they're internal. God puts worms and fire in their flesh. And they weep and feel their pain forever. Isaiah said there'll be shame. She says there'll be pain. Isaiah said you look on it with disgust. She says you look on it with pity. Because Judith is thinking that living people are going to be tormented forever and ever alive. And that's God's punishment. Isaiah had said, as all the Old Testament does, and I'm going to say all the New Testament does as well, that the, the wicked are, are destroyed, consumed, devoured, abolished, perish, die, and they're gone, and they never come back. Then there's a section of, of Old Testament, not Old Testament, of intertestamental literature called the Pseudepigrapha. Uh, this, these are books that are attributed to people who lived long before because the Jews in that period of time believed that God had finished writing the Bible and finished inspiring prophets. And if somebody came along and said, I've got a new prophecy from God, They'd say, get out of here. We don't believe there's any new prophecy. So if you had a new prophecy, what you wanted to do is say this was written by Enoch or this was written by Adam or this was written by Moses or Jeremiah scribe or somebody way back when prophets were doing their thing. And then they say, well, maybe so. So that's what happened and that's where they came from. But in the Pseudepigrapha, they say two things. They say some of them say the wicked will be consumed. Some of them say the wicked will be tormented forever. So there you have it, two choices. Well, I don't care if there's 15 choices. My point is just there's not just one choice. They did not all believe the same thing. There were different ideas about it, and this clearly shows that. The Dead Sea Scrolls, every, every one of the Dead Sea Scrolls that are translated into English seem to say the wicked will be totally consumed. 
The third edition of the fire that consumes came out in 2011. To give you an example of how things have changed in the past 32 years before that, when I did the first edition, there were eight Dead Sea Scrolls available in the English translation to ordinary people like me. Eight. And 32 years later, there are 800. And they're, 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 the study edition is two big books with Hebrew on one side and English on the other. I read all 2,200 pages of the English. And I couldn't find anything except consuming fire. The editor of that study edition is a Belgian former priest scholar by the name of uh, Florentino Garcia Martinez. I was at Lanier Theological Library just shortly after I'd done this particular work one day and the librarian said, come in here, Edward, somebody would like you to meet. I walk in, she said, this is Dr. Gar Florentino Garcia Martinez. I said, cool, dude, I've been wanting to meet you. <laughs> I didn't really say that. My California brother would have said it if he had been there. But uh, so I met him and I said, I've got a question. This is what I think I found. Is that right? He said, probably so. Just don't be too dogmatic because those guys are hard to figure out sometimes. <laughs> but uh, it's clear there was diversity. That's my point. All three views were held. And then finally, the rabbinical material has all three views. The rabbis cover the bases. There's one quick story I've got time for, I think. Uh, and the rabbinical material I think is really neat. One, one day, it's, one rabbi says, one day the people in Gehenna, in hell, were uh, listening and they heard beautiful singing, praising God. They say, where is that coming from? They say, up there in heaven, paradise. So they send word up there and what are you doing? Well, we're having a song fest. We're praising God. So the people in Gehenna say, we should sing with them. So they start singing with them. And God hears that and says, where is that coming from? <laughs> they say, the people in hell. He says, if they can sing that praise song, they should come up here with us. <laughs> And so that's the way one rabbi saw it. But uh, the rabbis had lots of variety, and all this literature together had very much variety. The point of that is simply this. The traditionalist argument has been that the Old Testament says nothing about the end of the wicked. It developed during the time between the Testaments. By the time of Jesus, everybody believed in the eternal torment. Therefore, that's what we must read Jesus as believing. Well, we had two wrongs so far. And uh, the Old Testament says much about the end of the wicked. It just says they'll be totally done away. And it did start the other view during the time between the Testaments, but it was not the Jewish view at the time of Jesus. It was a Jewish view among several. Third surprise. Hell has rare and limited use in the New Testament. One of the first comments by a scholar that got me kind of interested in this subject, not, uh, not to a great degree at that point, but somewhat. After I finished uh, my master's at Abilene Christian University, I wrote Dr. Tom Albright, who had been my thesis chairman, and said, what are some subjects that need more study? I'd like to continue doing research just for the fun of it. He said, well, there's several ideas. Here's one. He said, I find it interesting that the word Gehenna, for translate hell, is only used in the New Testament uh, 12 times. One is in James that says the tongue is set on fire by hell. The other 11 are all Jesus speaking. He's always speaking to Jews, always in or around Jerusalem. And that's the only time we ever see this word Gehenna. He said, I wonder how people outside Jerusalem and Gentile people and other people besides Jesus talked about the end of the wicked since they didn't use the word hell. If we'd gone back, it's kind of strange to think, but if we'd gone back and visited among those churches in the first century, and we brought up, when, how long has it been since you preached on hell? Hell? What's hell? They don't know the word. That's not the word they used most of the time. But it is used in the New Testament by Jesus 11 times. It's important to see what he says. What, what can we say about this word? 11 times in the Gospels, only used by Jesus only to Jews around Jerusalem. Traditionalist writers frequently say Jesus says more about hell than anybody in the New Testament. What, what you're supposed to think about that, what they really want you to think about that is, what I'm telling you about hell must be right, they're saying, 
And Jesus is the one that says it more than anybody. Well, the second half of that's true. The first half is not. What they're saying about hell is not what Jesus said. But Jesus is the only one that uses the word hell or Gehenna. What does he say about it? That's the important question. Well, here's an example of what he says about it. Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. Let's stop just a minute. What do you suppose he means kill the soul? Well, what do you suppose he means kill the body? He must mean the same thing by kill the soul that he means by kill the body or something similar because he puts them in this kind of contrast. Don't fear those who kill the body, but uh, fear him who can kill the soul. Fear him who is able to destroy soul and body in Gehenna. Destroy. That's the Greek word of polyme. So that's the word he uses there. Destroy. Jesus says God is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And if you think of soul and body as a way of saying the whole person, what's left when God destroys soul and body? Nothing. Here's Gehenna today, by the way. It was a valley outside Jerusalem. Some people believe it was used as a garbage place in the days of Jesus. It was clearly a place in the Old Testament, in the very early days of the Old Testament, for idol worship, for offering children as sacrifices. They beat on drums while they were doing it to drown out their screams. It was a cursed place, and the prophets were given by God curses on this place to say God it was an abomination, and it would be a place of abomination in the hereafter. This became the place name for the place of eternal torment, as, as, as those views developed, and for the punishment of the wicked, as other views were present as well. <clears throat> so, that was a quick one I got through before I realized we were done. Let's back up a second, see if I missed anything. Gehenna, the word translate hell in the New Testament, for the place of final punishment, 11 times only, all in the Gospels, nowhere else, only by Jesus, by nobody else, only to Jews in and around Jerusalem, to nobody else. That's what we can say about the word Gehenna's usage. What Jesus says about it is, God is able to destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. And uh, obviously not taking time because we don't have time to go into detail, but this is an overview. If you'll buy the little book, The Hell of Final Word, you'll get it all in the easy to read edition. If you want to go to sleep reading it, get the big book and uh, you can see everything when you're awake from time to time. Surprising truth number four. The traditionists say that everybody believed in eternal torment. That's what we must assume Jesus teaches. And they say, by the way, when you read the rest of the New Testament outside the Gospels, that's what everybody else teaches too, eternal torment. Well, that's easy to say. But what do we find when we actually look? What we find is this surprising truth number four. Jesus teaches the destruction of those who reject God's grace. So let's look a little more at Jesus' teaching first. We've already looked at this verse. And then Jesus says in John 3.16, Whoever believes in Him shall not perish. Same word translated destroy in that last verse we looked at. Not perish, but have eternal life. That's the contrast. Life on the one hand, perish on the other. Somebody says, well, sometimes those words are used figuratively. Yes, they are. Well, what, what's the usage in the Gospels? These are actually a few of the times that the same Greek word is used in the Gospels. Every time this word is used of human beings in the Gospel, being done this too, it's always clearly extermination, uh, execution, death, murder, Wipe out, gone, kaput, they're not here anymore. These are some examples. If you just skim over these, what do these words mean? Every one of these mean die, perish, destroy, murder, done away with, gone. But there are other phrases somebody says that teach conscious unending torment in the mouth of Jesus. So let's look quickly at some of those. What about gnashing of teeth? Robert Peterson, who's one of the most prolific traditionalist writers today and the co-author with me of Two Views of Hell from InterVarsity, he says throughout his, his own book on hell, probably 20 times, every time it comes to gnashing of teeth, he says this tells us 
about the great pain that the wicked are suffering. Well, is that right? How do we find out? Look and see how else the Bible uses it. How does the Bible use it? The problem with traditional interpretation on this subject is they do not let the Bible explain itself. They say this is what the Bible says, this is what it means, and by cracky it means just the opposite. But if we let the Bible explain itself, we learn what the words really mean. Gnashing of teeth, what does that mean? Somebody's hurting? No, remember Stephen. When his enemies are about to kill him, he says, I see the Son of Man at the right hand of the throne in heaven. And they rushed at him, gnashing at him with their teeth. They're ready to chew him up like a wild animal. Ready to devour him. Gnashing teeth. It's grinding their teeth in anger. That's what the word means. And everywhere it's used in the Bible, it seems to mean that. If you just look it up for yourself, you'll see what I mean. Gnashing teeth. Not, not pain. Anger. Eternal punishment. Eternal fire. Somebody says, surely that means eternal torment. It's got to mean that. What else can it mean? I'm so glad you asked. Eternal punishment, eternal fire. First, the word eternal. Two, two meanings of eternal as the Bible uses the word. First, it's a quality. We read of eternal salvation, eternal redemption, eternal destruction, eternal judgment, eternal punishment, eternal fire. Every one of these means whatever it's talking about of the age to come. Eternal redemption is redemption of the age to come. It's not something that belongs totally to this world. Eternal judgments, judgment of the age to come. And so eternal is a quality. Eternal punishment could just mean punishment of the age to come. It means more than that, but it could just mean that. Eternal fire is fire of the age to come. I had a first year Greek teacher at Florida Christian College, a man named Edgar Shrigley from Florence, Alabama. Shrigley told us one day in class he remembered growing up and he was arguing with his Baptist buddy about who's going to hell because they're in the wrong church. And they're arguing on Sunday morning while they're out fishing instead of going to church. <laughs> and he said he remembered very well striking a match and touching it to his buddy's arm and say, you think that hurts? You're going to burn worse than that in hell because you're in the Baptist church, not the church of Christ. Well, this is a quality, eternal quality. And eternal fire doesn't mean it's for Baptists, but it means it's uh, of the age to come, in part at least. It also has to do with the results. When we see the word eternal destruction, that doesn't mean eternally destroying. It means it's destroyed and the destruction lasts forever. When we see the word eternal judgment, it doesn't mean God's judging forever. It means it's judged and it happens and it's over and the judgment that comes from it lasts forever. When the word is used of result words, it means eternal results, not eternal processes that bring about the result. And so eternal punishment doesn't mean eternally punishing. It means eternal punishment that happens and the result lasts forever. And we've already seen that with Sodom and Gomorrah where we learned that Jude says they're an example of the punishment of eternal fire. They're not still burning today. They were burned up and they're gone forever. And Jude said that's what eternal fire means. Punishment. What does punishment mean? Simply put, uh, the penal consequences of wrongdoing imposed under the law by someone with judicial authority. There can be all kinds of punishment. I suspect in the state where you live, it's like it is in the great empire state of Texas. Hooray for Texas. Uh, if somebody does wrong, they might pay a fine. They might go to jail. They might go to prison. They might have capital punishment. All of those things could be punishment. It doesn't, it doesn't say what it is. It just says why it happens. But eternal punishment is defined by Paul. He says that when Jesus comes, he names a couple of classes of, of people. He says they will be punished with everlasting destruction. What's the punishment? Everlasting destruction. What's everlasting destruction? They're destroyed and they're gone forever. And that's the punishment. It's capital punishment. And he describes it that way. St. Augustine does not agree with my view. He did not when he was living, rather. Uh, and I don't, I don't mean that the way it sounded. What I mean is, what I mean is, I don't think he's thinking anything right now. I think he's asleep. But uh, 
he, he made this statement which I agree with whether he agrees with mine or not. He said, when a very serious crime is punished by death and the execution takes only a minute, we don't consider the minute as a measure of punishment, but the fact that the criminal is forever removed from the company of the living. So the uh, capital punishment doesn't mean you're tormented forever. It means you're gone forever once you're dead. And I think that's a very good statement to describe it. Surprising truth number five. Other New Testament writers say the wicked will die, perish, and be destroyed. John the Baptist says of Jesus, He will gather the wheat in the barns, but burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. What does it sound like, burn up the chaff? What does that sound like It's going to happen to the wicked? Burn up. What's burn up mean? Burn up. What's burn up mean? Burn up. What's burn up mean? Never burn up. Nothing like burn up. No way resemble burn up. That's what the traditional view says. But John the Baptist says he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Even if that were not enough to say it means what it says, he says it will burn up with unquenchable fire. What is unquenchable fire? Somebody says unquenchable means it will burn forever. Is that what it means? No, it means it will never be put out prematurely. You can't quench it. You can't extinguish it. It will burn until there's nothing left. And so he gathers the wheat in the barn, burns up the chaff with unquenchable fire. We all know what unquenchable fire is. If you call the Nashville quenching department, they come out and quench the fire. And that's put it out before it's burned everything up. That's what the word unquenchable means. The people in the New Testament times knew what this word meant because God had said it many times in the Old Testament. Over and over He said things like this. If you don't do what I tell you, I'll kindle a fire. It will devour your palace or your city or your nation and it will never be quenched. He's just saying, you can't put out my fire. It will burn you up completely until there's nothing left. But what do the New Testament writers say about the end of the wicked? We already know this. They don't use the word hell because that's only used by Jesus. But this is, these are the words they do use. Let's see what they say. James says the, the, the death is the way he describes it. Destruction. Riches will consume their flesh like fire. Fatten for the day of slaughter. Death. Which view most resembles these words? One, one traditionalist writer says in a book called Hell on Trial, or Hell Under Fire, rather, he says, uh, James doesn't say much about the end of the wicked, and what he says is insignificant, so we're not going to pay much attention to that. But he says, by the way, what he says is death, destruction, consume like fire, fatten for the day of slaughter, and death. And I'm saying, well, why do you think that's not saying much? It's not saying much you want it to say, but it's saying a lot if you just look at what it says. Then we have Acts. Uh, tomorrow's lesson is on evangelism, rethinking evangelism. And I'm going to have a quote tomorrow from, uh, I forgot his name, so I'll save him until tomorrow. <laughs> in, the, in the book of Acts, we might expect if the, if, the, if the early Christian teachers and preachers really went out preaching eternal torment, this is where you'd expect to find some reference to that, right? That's where we read about what they said when they went out and preached. Where do they, what do they say about this subject? Well, there are only four references in the whole book of Acts to anything to do with judgment at the end of the world. Only four. And only one of those has anything to do with what happens to the wicked. The other three simply say there will be a day of judgment. Paul and Felix argued about judgment. God uh, appointed a day in which He will judge the world. Uh, Cornelius is told in Acts 10. The people in Athens are told in Acts 17. Those three passages say there will be a judgment day, but that's all they say. There's only one other passage that says anything about what will happen to the wicked in the day of judgment. And that's this passage in Acts 3.23. Whoever does not listen to that prophet, Jesus, the prophet like Moses, predicted in Deuteronomy 18, whoever does not listen to him shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. The word that's translated utterly destroyed there is a, a Greek word that's only found one time in the New Testament. Ex holy ruthesitai. 
and the word is only found in the New Testament once. It's used in the Old Testament Greek several times. It's the regular word in the Old Testament for capital punishment. It's the word in the Old Testament that describes what happened to the people in the flood. That's a very strong word. And it, it, it's, a, it's so strong that if some of you know the name Spiro Zodiates. He was a Greek man who wrote uh, preacher study books and things. Uh, when I was working on this book 32 years ago, I drove to Chattanooga one day and visited him at his kitchen table. I said, Dr. Zodiates, here's this word, ex holoruthesitai. What does it mean to you being a native Greek? He looked at it a minute and said, this is very interesting. If this was the only passage in the Bible on the subject, everybody would have to believe what you're saying. But that's the only passage in the book of Acts on final punishment. What does Paul say about it? Paul's three favorite words are these. Die, perish, and destroy. He used them over and over again. He also talks about other things like anathema, not enter God's kingdom. There are other flavors to this. But the key words are die, perish, and destroy. He never says tormented forever or kept alive forever. Hebrews, cursed and burned, fire that consumes, destroyed, consuming fire. Peter and Jude, be like the flood, be like Sodom, destroy and perish, blackest darkness, black holes in space, absorbed, gone, nothing left anymore. John, what does he say? Lake of fire and brimstone. Where does that come from? Sodom, of course. Sodom was rained with fire and brimstone. And the words thereafter in the Bible always mean total destruction, nothing left. John speaks of the second death. What does it mean, second death? He's contrasting with the book of life in the verse just before. And so there's the book of life and there's a second death. The choices are life and death. Smoke ascending, what does that mean? It comes from Sodom. The next day Abraham goes out and looks where Sodom used to be. And all he sees is smoke ascending. It's quiet. It's still. Nobody's suffering. They're all gone. And smoke is all that's left. We would say mushroom-shaped cloud. If the Bible does not teach that God will make people stay alive forever and torment them without end, where did the idea come from and how did it get started? Surprising truth number six, the immortal soul is where it came from. And that's a pagan invention. Immortality is God's gift to the redeemed. It's not something that everybody has naturally or will have eventually. Socrates and Plato taught it. Every human has a mortal body, they said, inhabited by an immortal soul. And that became so commonplace that most Christians think the Bible says it. But it doesn't. In fact, it says the opposite. This is to remind you to buy the book and go to the movie. <laughs> the Bible portrays the human creature totally mortal. God makes a body out of earth. He breathes into his nostrils breath or spirit of life. He became a living soul. He didn't have a living soul. He became a living soul. And man, when he dies, the spirit of breath goes back to God and he becomes a dead soul. He's no longer alive. God alone possesses immortality. Every time the Bible uses immortality of human beings, it's always the righteous, never the lost. It's always in the resurrection, never now. It's always in a holistic body, not just a soul or spirit floating around like Casper, the friendly ghost. The New Testament uh, teaches what we've seen. The apostolic fathers who come next teach the same thing. In the time of uh, Athenagoras and Tertullian, there were Greek philosophers who were converted to Christianity and they brought with them into the church the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. Sorry, I don't have time to pause. I'll talk to you after we get through. Uh, Athenagoras said, uh, since the cause of man's creation is perpetual existence, he must be preserved forever. And this philosophy came into the church. Plato first goes to church, I called it. Tertullian said, the soul does not need saving. Because the soul is immortal already. Jesus came to save the body so it could live with the soul, which is already immortal. Tertullian said, when Jesus says, fear God who is able to destroy soul and body in hell, we should not think he means God will destroy the soul because we know souls are immortal and cannot be destroyed. Well, if you can't destroy them, you've got to do something with them. 
so they burn them forever. Clement and Origen come later. They say, everybody may be finally restored to heaven. Or Nobius comes later and says, I don't believe anything Plato said. St. <laughs> Augustine comes along and says, I agree with all this stuff. And because he said it was right, the church, the Catholic church, began to teach it. And Sam developed uh, intricacies on it. Very interesting, but we don't have time to talk about them. Aquinas said some more. Uh, Dante did even more. His, his uh, worst circle in hell was freezing. And I don't know why we don't say cold as hell instead of hot. <laughs> Luther said maybe the doctrines of immortality of soul are wrong. Luther said it very tactfully like this. The philosophical arguments for the immortality of the soul belong on the great dung heap of Roman decretals. And when he said that, Sir Thomas More said, no, you're wrong. Uh, Tyndale said, no, you're right. Calvin said, I think you're wrong because the Anabaptists say that and everything they say is wrong. <laughs> but Heinrich Bullinger in Switzerland wrote the second Helvetic Confession in 1560-something. He said, what the Catholic Church said is right. What Calvin says is right. This is going to be Protestant doctrine as well as Catholic doctrine and it slid into Protestantism. Came to America as Puritanism, later became fundamentalism, and we're still worrying with it today. Why, must, why does this even matter? Three quick answers. It's not a salvation issue. It should not be a fellowship issue, though the traditionists frequently make it that. Nevertheless, important because we speak in God's name. If we say we're telling people what God said, God wants us to say what He said. He gets very unhappy when people say they're saying what He said and they say something different. Second reason it impacts evangelism. There are many atheists who say, I'm an atheist because of that doctrine of hell that you have. I can't believe a good God would keep people alive forever just to torment them. And finally, it speaks about God's character. That's the main reason I think it's important. God's character is involved. In conclusion, the surprises from the Bible we found are not tricky or difficult or complicated. In fact, you already know two scriptures that say it all. If you don't remember anything else I said here today, just remember these two scriptures that you already know. And you could have slept through the whole thing. Two scriptures say it all. You already know them. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. It's a clear contrast. Could not be any plainer. Death or life. Who has a problem knowing what those words mean when they're put side by side? Or the other verse you know is John 3.16. Not perish, but have eternal life. Perish and life. Simple choice. It finally comes down to this. Life or death. Time is up. I'm sorry not to have a chance to visit with you more. If, if you can come back tomorrow, we'll be talking about evangelism. There are going to be some surprises about that. Equally surprising to these. And if you can see the movie tonight or tomorrow, I hope you'll do that. If you want the book, you can get it at Lipscomb or at ACU.